uh, on behalf of Department of Hematology and Bone Marrow Transplant at Institute of Blood Disorder, we welcome you in this fifth episode of Innovations in Hematology. And today's topic is acute GBHD, which is a nightmare for all the physicians. Uh, somebody has used ATG upfront, somebody has used abetacept upfront, but still acute GBHD evades us into a clinical practices and creates a problem for the patients as well still leading to deaths in many of the patients going undergoing a bone marrow transplant. So it's still an unconquered frontier. And today to understand this, we have the renowned faculty from MD Anderson, Amin Alusi, and Dr. Uday Popat, who will be making us understand through going through these challenging situations in acute GBHD. To conduct this, we have Dr. Nikhil, who is our lead specialist, who will take care of the proceedings from here on. And he has a few slides, uh, one slides to show our approach at Department of Hematology at Fortis Gurugram. We welcome you all for this academic feast and I'm hopefully that after one hour we'll be more sensible and enlightened to how to treat acute GVHD. Over to Dr. Nikhil. Thank you, Dr. Bhargav. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yeah, so we welcome you all for this Innovations in Hematology webinar series. Today, we have a webinar on challenging situations in acute GBHD. And we have two prominent speakers from MD Anderson joining us for this, Dr. Uday Popar and Dr. Amin. Dr. Uday is a professor of medicine Department of Stem Cell Transplantation and Cellular Therapy, University of Texas, MD Anderson Cancer Center. I invite Dr. Uday to introduce the main speaker for the day, Dr. Amin Alausi. So, uh, th th thank you, Dr. Nikhil, and thank you, Dr. Bargo, for that uh, very kind introduction. When I was asked to give this talk, I said, okay, I'll go ahead and talk about graft versus host disease. And then I got a series of questions uh, that Dr. Nikhil sent me that all of you had. And uh, what I realized was I did, did not know very much about all those questions. Uh, this was about what to do in steroid refractory and ruxolitinib refractory GVHT. There isn't much data out there. So then how do you handle this? And I thought you really needed an expert to tell you and distill from whatever little data and world of experience that he has to teach you about what to do in this sort of situation. And the best person is my colleague, uh, Amin Alusi. He's a great friend. And he, on a day's notice, agreed to do this talk, spent whole of yesterday preparing the talk. And I'm so grateful to you, Amin. Uh, he, he leads our uh, graft versus host disease re research effort, and he runs a stellar graft versus host disease clinic. So if you're here at in Texas, it would be worth seeing him. And he has led all our studies from MD Anderson, many of the study of the national uh, BMT-CTN group. And uh, over to you, Amin. We all look forward to hearing from you. Before Thank you so I much. Hand, uh, Dr. Okay. Amin. Yeah, before I yeah. hand over the section to Dr. Amin, I would like to briefly tell the audience what our approach at Fortis Institute of Blood Disorders Gurgaon is. So any patient presenting with acute GVHD, we start injection methylprednisolone, 1 mg per kg for upper gut GVHD and 2 mg per kg for lower gut GVHD. We do not wait for 4 to 5 days on methylprednisolone if there is no reduction in the stool volume or frequency, or if there is progression of symptoms, even after three doses, we add on ruxolitinib. And if patient is not responding to a combination of steroids with ruxolitinib in the first week to 10 days, our choice of third line treatment is etanercept along with ECT. While we use FMT and mesenchymal stem cells as adjuvant therapies, vedolizumab has been a useful agent for us, especially in patients who are refractory to all the above mentioned lines of therapy. It would be really interesting to know from Dr. Amin what her practice is and what is the evidence supporting it. 
he is one of the pioneers in the field of GVHD. Before I hand it over to him, I would also like to inform the audience regarding our next session. This is also a webinar which is very relevant for transplant physicians, where Dr. Medat Askar would be speaking to us on post-transplant chimerism and what the physician should know about interpretation of the same for making informed treatment decisions. So over to you, Dr. Amin. I'll stop sharing so my screen. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share my uh, screen. And as I'm doing that, I want to thank uh, you all for inviting me and thank my uh, dear friend and distinguished colleague uh, Uday Popat for his kind introduction. Um, let me make sure I get the right screen up. Um, share. Okay, can you see the slides okay? Yeah, yes. your slides are visible. Okay, perfect. So um, as I understood the topics that you would like me to review today is mainly on the treatment of steroid refractory and ruxolid and refractory acute GVHD. And um, I think before we uh, jump into it, I have a slide with my disclosures. There we go. Um, my main objectives uh, from today's uh, uh, lecture is to review with you um, the data with regard to uh, ruxolitinib and steroid refractory acute GVHD. Hopefully I can um, make the case that the best uh, way to treat this is to prevent it. And I'll show a couple slides on that. Um, and I'll lay out uh, uh, definitions around what steroid refractory and ruxolitinib refractory GVHD is and what the evidence may uh, be for that. Of course, I'll review the, the REACH 1 and 2 data uh, given support for the use of ruxolitinib. I'll um, uh, review some clinical pearls I've developed over the years in the treatment of this uh, disease population. And I'll uh, briefly cover um, some exciting areas of research with regard to tissue repair and the biome, uh, mainly in patients with uh, steroid refractory gut GVHD. Um, I'm hoping to have about a good solid 15 to 20 minutes to review the questions that you provided in advance of today's lecture. Um, I will give a cursory response to those questions, but later I'll forward along to Nikhil, and which you can forward on to all on this uh, uh, call this morning. Um, uh, all the slides that I have uh, addressing the questions as well as the important and relevant papers. So how do I treat steroid refractory or ruxolitinib refractory acute GVHD? I think um, the best way to start is to look at the impact of these this disease, this complication of transplant. Um, with regard to steroid refractory acute GVHD, uh, patients who meet this definition have a twofold higher risk of non-relapse mortality, approaching 40% at six months. And... Um, patients who are resistant uh, to further lines of treatment with ruxolitinib do particularly poorly with non-relapsed mortality that approaches uh, 80% um, at uh, day 100 and a median uh, survival of just one month. Um, I would contend that while I've spent a, a great deal of, uh, of, of my my practice and research and uh, the treatment of these patients, um, patients here at MD Anderson with Ruxo refractory acute GVHD do equally poor as I'm sure those patients do in India. And I don't have any magic sauce to uh, still upon you on how we can um, further uh, op, um, uh, improve uh, those patients with very uh, poor prognosis. Um, so how do I treat steroid refractory or ruxolitinib refractory acute GVHD? Well, number one, I try to, at all costs, prevent my patients from, from, from uh, getting this disease. Um, it's an uh, ounce of uh, prevention is worth uh, its weight in gold, as they say. And how do we prevent this? Well, certainly we have thoughtful considerations of who the donors are and uh, have a team to look at uh, optimizing donors. Um, we take into consideration um, graph source. Um, I'm sorry, someone, if I uh, hear a little background, if you don't mind muting yourself. Uh, um, um, so we pay attention to graft source and in high-risk patients uh, consider marrow over peripheral blood. 
but importantly, GVHD prophylaxis is, is the mainstay for preventing patients from developing um, high-risk acute GVHD, including steroid refractory. Um, for uh, the dawn of time here at MD Anderson, our standard of care for preventing acute uh, uh, GVHD was uh, with the use of um, uh, Tacro and mini dose methotrexate. And in match unrelated donor transplants, uh, similar to what's done in Europe, we would historically give low dose uh, rabbit ATG. Um, in 2013, 14, 15, we began to adopt the post-transplant cyclophosphamide platform where it's uh, post size given on days three and four in combination with tacrolimus with and or without uh, mycophenolate. Um, here we see in this slide results of uh, just about a thousand transplants between 2015 and 2020. And what we see that uh, patients who received post-transplant cyclophosphamide uh, with tacrone uh, with or without mycophenolate had uh, much improved uh, uh, GVHD relapse-free survival. So this composite endpoints looks at uh, patients who are free from grade three to four acute GVHD, uh, chronic GVHD requiring immune suppressive therapy. Uh, they have to be in remission and they have to be alive. Uh, and Griffiths uh, is significantly better in patients who received post-SI versus our historical uh, TAC methotrexate with ATG and MUDs. Um, importantly, uh, at least for the MUD group, um, uh, this was mainly driven not through a reduction in acute or chronic GVHD, but lower non-relapse mortality with post-SI, mainly from less infections, uh, especially viral infections, than when uh, ATG was employed. In the MAT sibling uh, cohort, where we uh, historically would give just TAC and methotrexate by itself, post-SI indeed lowered uh, chronic GVHD, and chronic GVHD requiring immune suppressive therapy, but had comparable rates of uh, mitigation against acute GVHD and non relapse mortality um, uh, um, um, as uh, those who received uh, uh, the standard of care TAC methotrexate alone. Um, there is really no downside to given post-SI. Uh, here we see relapse rates are identical, whether we used our historical approach or post-SI, um, uh, but uh, Griffith's free survival was markedly better. Of course, this was further supported in our multi-center uh, BMT, BMT CTN 1703 trial, which was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Here, this was a randomized phase three trial for recipients of matched sibling and unrelated donor transplants getting peripheral blood uh, uh, graphs uh, following reduced intensity conditioning, and patients were randomized to either uh, post uh, post-transplant psi plus tacro and uh, mycophenolate versus uh, tac methotrexate alone. And uh, once again, Griffiths was uh, uh, much better uh, for patients who received post-psi. Um, and uh, this was mainly due to less acute GVHD, um, uh, grade three to four, uh, less grade three to four acute GVHD, six versus 15%, and less chronic GVHD requiring suppressive therapy. Um, what are some clinical perils for preventing steroid refractory acute GVHD? Well, I would uh, uh, really make the strong case that as an institution, you should really have uh, well-written and uh, SOPs for uh, the workup and evaluation of patients with suspected acute GVHD. Importantly, you should do, uh, uh, make I make the case for prompt diagnosis and treatment of these patients, especially those who present with high-risk manifestations, diarrhea, severe abdominal pain. And we never delay the start of treatment for workup. Uh, if a patient is post allo and uh, um, uh, unless it's very obvious to be something else, you assume that their diarrhea is from uh, GVHD and you start high-dose steroids while further evaluating these patients. Um, we follow our patients very closely, especially when we're tapering them off of uh, prophylaxis, immune suppressive prophylaxis, and following donor livocyte infusions, and we promptly intervene in those patients who uh, present with manifestations. Uh, but despite doing everything, roughly 5 to 10% of patients will go on to develop steroid refractory acute GVHD, and that's the, uh, the, going to be the bulk of what we're talking about today. 
So for starters, how do we know if our patients have a steroid refractory acute GVHD? Well, the standard definition um, that has been employed uh, since dawn was patients who had progression of organ stage after three days of high-dose steroids at two milligrams per kilogram per day would be considered steroid refractory, as would those who fail to improve after seven to 10 days. And uh, patients who have a flare after initial response following tapering of steroids below some specified dose, say a half a milligram or one milligram per kilogram per day, could also be considered steroid refractory or uh, better defined as steroid dependent. Um, but where did this definition come from? Is there any validity to this? Does it, has it ever been extensively studied? Well, uh, Forever, the answer was no. This was just expert consensus opinion. But in 2017, 2018, um, the MAGIC Acute GVHD Consortium, which we participate with, um, uh, looked at this uh, question and they took all patients within the registry, the Acute GVHD registry, who had new onset acute GVHD um, requiring treatment. And so all patients who met uh, definition of having new onset acute GVHD and got started on therapy. And um, using the definitions that I laid out on the previous slide, roughly half the patients had a response to steroids by day seven, and half the patients either had progression of organ stage after three days or no response by day seven and would meet the definition of steroid refractory. And in fact, the, uh, the data suggests that this definition does have merit. In fact, patients who uh, meet the uh, above criteria for being sensitive or resistant uh, behave much differently. Non-relapse mortality is better than twofold higher, approaching 40% uh, at six months for those who are labeled as steroid refractory or meet the definition of steroid refractory. Uh, overall survival is uh, is worse for those patients as well, and the likelihood at day 28 for these patients to uh, have responsive GVHD is much different as well. Um, so that was important and validated the definition, but importantly, uh, the the Magic Consortium went on and delved a little deeper into these this population of so-called steroid refractory patients. And so they took that population, again, roughly half the patients who met the definition of steroid refractory, and um, um, uh, they drew uh, the serum uh, plasma biomarkers, which have previously been validated in the upfront setting for acute GVHD, that's uh, ST2 and REG3-alpha, and they drew it at day seven uh, at the point where they would be labeled as refractory or not. And what they found was very interesting. Um, roughly a half to maybe as high as 72% of patients, depending whether they're in their initial or validation cohorts, uh, came back with a biomark biomarker panel that was in fact quite low. And the other roughly half patients came back with a biomarker panel that was uh, high and would uh, correlate with high risk disease. Um, and if you look at the outcomes based on the biomarkers at day seven, you see that those patients who had low biomarkers on day uh, seven, uh, uh, ST2 and REG3-alpha, uh, they had very low non-relapse mortality and really did not differ from those who were labeled as steroid responsive uh, uh, based on that definition. Whereas those who had the high biomarker panels had extremely high non-relapse mortality and clearly uh, behaved much differently. So what does this tell us? Well, in fact, using that definition, it's not a perfect definition. And maybe as much as half the patients we label as steroid resistant are truly not resistant, but more uh, better considered what I like to call slow responders. Um, they haven't achieved their response yet using that standard definition, and maybe half are truly steroid resistant. So what do we do with this data? Well, it's important when reading manuscripts and interpreting results of clinical trials for steroid refractory acute GBHD, you wanna look at the definition of steroid refractory that's being employed in those trials. You wanna look at the median time from start of steroids to second line therapy, because this will tell you how many of these patients were truly steroid refractory, and results can vary quite markedly across these studies based on those factors. Uh, it's also important clinically with respect to steroids. Skin normally responds quicker than lower GI and liver, and, um, and uh, those populations day seven may be less predictive. Um, I found it very interesting to see that you 
consider your patients refractory after just three days of steroids and start ruxolitinib. Um, um, I think that's worth further discussion. Um, um, and um, maybe if time allows, we can de uh, you know discuss why um, you do that and 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 the pros and cons maybe to that approach. Um, a sizable portion of ultimate responders may take longer than seven days to get better, and perhaps biomarkers at day seven can further stratify these populations. So what about the treatment of steroid refractory acute GVHD? Is ruxolitinib the standard of care? Well, based on the REACH 1 and 2 trials, we would say yes. Uh, the REACH 1 trial was the multi-center uh, phase two trial uh, published in blood. Uh, first author, Madan Jagezi, uh, 2020. Uh, patients uh, uh, were 12 years or older, had grade two to four uh, corticoid refractory acute GVHD based on my magic criteria. Uh, majority of the patients had failed steroids. A small percentage of the patients had received uh, one line of therapy beyond steroids. Um, these patients uh, received uh, continuation of high dose steroids in combination with initially ruxolitinib five milligrams twice daily with the dose escalated to 10 milligrams twice daily pretty quickly if uh, in the absence of cytopenias. Um, Ruxo was continued in treatment until treatment failure, unacceptable toxicity or death. And the primary endpoint of this trial was day 28 overall response. Um, here we see the patient characteristics. Um, um, while patients 12 years and older could uh, participate, uh, there were no patients on this phase two trial. Uh, less than 18, median age was 58 years. Um, about 20% uh, of the patients were over the age of 65. Um, there was a third of the patients who had grade two acute GVHD. The remainder had grade three to four uh, uh, acute GVHD. Um, median time from steroid initiation, again, a very important uh, patient characteristical look at was 15 days with uh, the range being three to 285 days since uh, diagnosis and start of steroids. Um, about uh, a third of the patients uh, progressed had progressive acute GVHD definition where they progressed after three days, 40% uh, 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 met definition by no response by day seven. And again, the majority of the patients uh, had received just steroids uh, prior to receiving ruxolitinib. Here we see the overall response rate on REACH-1 was uh, just better than 50%, taking uh, response at any time point, uh, overall response at any time point, 73% of the patients achieved a response, including uh, better than half having a complete response. Uh, the median time to response was seven days, and predictors for response uh, uh, um, in multivariate was limited to just uh, patients' um, initial presenting uh, grade at the time of enrollment. Patients who had grade two steroid refractory acute GVHD did much better than those who had grade three to four, not surprisingly. In terms of predictors of overall response included whether they responded to ruxolitinib or not, um, the acute GVHD grade and the duration of steroid exposure um, prior to enrollment uh, were also predictors. Here we see uh, the outcomes uh, with regard to overall survival and non relapse mortality. Those who responded do markedly better uh, than those who had, were refractory to, chronic, uh, to uh, ruxolitinib. Um, again, the median survival is just 28 days for rux failure patients, and uh, um, uh, non relapse mortality uh, is better than 80%. Um, REACH-2 was the uh, international randomized uh, 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 phase uh, three trial of ruxolitinib versus best available therapy. Similar eligibility criteria as in REACH-1, except uh, they could have only received steroids. Um, and again, the primary endpoint similar to REACH-1 was overall response at day 28. Um, here were the acceptable uh, best available therapies that centers could pick from, ATG, ECP, mesenchymal stem cells, low-dose methotrexate, mycophenolate, mTOR inhibitors, etanercept, and infliximab. Um, patient population um, 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 and responses based on acute GVHD grade, uh, um, 75% of the patients at the time of enrollment who had uh, 
received bruxolitinib and grade two acute GVHD responded, and this was better than the 50% for best available therapy. But importantly, bruxolitinib out, uh, outperformed best available therapy, even in those with grade three to four acute GVHD. Um, better than 50% response rate for uh, day 28 uh, versus roughly 25 to 30% uh, in those patients with grade three to four who received best available therapy. Um, uh, so the day 28 overall response, the primary endpoint was markedly better for patients who were randomized to ruxolitinib, 60% uh, versus 40%. Uh, but somewhat disappointingly, the durable overall response at day 56 was just 40% for the rux arm. This was better than best available therapy, um, but um, um, room for improvement is certainly needed. Uh, the duration fa uh, of failure-free survival show is shown in the panel to the right. Um, you have to be cautious with interpretation, interpreting these results because uh, these patients could cross over to receive ruxolitinib and you see an artificial steep fall in the orange curve uh, because patients crossed over um, based on design. And so uh, you have to be cautious interpreting interpreting the failure-free survival uh, as uh, based on the design of the trial. Uh, in terms of um, uh, safety of ruxolitinib, uh, this is important because uh, we're comparing against best available therapy and, the, and we're able to compare toxicities across, across treatment arms. And um, there were signals, not surprisingly, that anemia was worse for those who were randomized to ruxolitinib versus best available therapy, maybe thrombocytopenia as well. But uh, overall, uh, grade three and higher adverse events didn't differ between uh, the two arms. Um, CMV didn't infection, or fibremia didn't differ between the two arms. And um, 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 the, the drug seemed fairly well tolerated. Um, Again, disappointingly, non-relapse mortality at 18 months did not differ between those who are randomized the best available therapy versus RUX, um, but median overall survival did favor ruxolitinib at 11 months versus six and a half for best available therapy. So for all practical purposes, ruxolitinib should be considered the standard of care for steroid refractory acute GVHD. However, durable day 56 remission rate of 40% is discouraging, as is the lack of reduction in non-relapsed mortality and better therapies are still needed, which is an area of our active research. Um, so how do I treat steroid refractory or ruxolitinib refractory acute GVHD? Here are just some clinical pearls. Uh, number one, uh, we do not continue therapies that are not working, and I'll dive into a little bit of how long I continue ruxolitinib in the answer question and answer session at the end. Uh, we have institutional taper plans for tapering of steroids, including tapering of steroids in patients to deem steroid refractory. Uh, number three, if the gut is working, and the, provided the patient doesn't have an ileus, we strongly encourage continuation of enteral nutrition. Uh, we don't uh, believe, and, and there is some uh, limited data to support this, that gut rest uh, is beneficial for patients with acute GVHD at the lower GI tract, again, in the absence of ileus. Uh, I caution uh, the use of uh, uh, anti-motility agents and pain medications, uh, the combination of those two in patients with advanced lower stage GI GVHD. Uh, these patients are very prone to development of ileus and, and they'll get there quicker with the uh, in patients who are requiring um, narcotics as well, uh, and are also receiving anti-motility agents. Uh, we uh, pride in ourselves in using a multidisciplinary approach to these patients. We involve physical therapy, nutrition, and others. Uh, we do intensive infection monitoring, which I'll review a little bit in the question and answer. And we give prophylaxis and uh, promptly treat infections as they occur. Um, importantly, just like when treating cancer, you do need to recognize when palliative care should be considered. And those patients who have very poor performance status, multi-line resistant acute GVHD, advanced age, multi-organ dysfunction, concurrent severe infections, and active leukemia, really disease uh, palliation as opposed to ongoing treatment should be considered. Um, so the majority of patients who have steroid refractory acute GVHD have lower GI involvement. Um, we've improved over the years where we've seen lower rates of grade three to four, lower GI GVHD, but still in, with regard to uh, acute GVHD mortality, 80% 
will occur in patients with lower GI GVHD. And this is really the population where most research is needed uh, in terms of improving outcomes. In a few moments, uh, for the next few moments, I want to review uh, a question that's commonly asked to me. So how do we, uh, uh, so how do patients with steroid refractory, typically GI, GVHD, get better? Is it through the use of immune suppression therapy, or should we be instead looking at tissue repair and tissue regeneration? Um, uh, importantly, um, certainly uh, the backbone of treatment of acute GVHD has been immune suppressive agents over the years. Um, active area of research is looking into tissue repair and regeneration, as well as uh, uh, targeting the GI microbiome. Um, but it is artificial to separate these three because uh, the GI tract, as I'll lay out in the next few slides, these processes are all interrelated. They really are not distinct um, um, pathways for treatment. And, um, um, and uh, uh, the next few slides will elucidate that further. So what is the immune bi biology of the GI epithelium and the stem cell uh, GI compartment? Uh, well, for starters, uh, the GI tract is the second largest epithelium in the body, and it separates a host from the external environment. Uh, the GI tract has been called the largest immune organ in the body. And the intestinal epithelium is in direct content with uh, uh, the content of the lumen, and it must, uh, both serve as a barrier function as well as allow nutritional absorption. Um, it's under persistent assault from the luminal contents, and this requires epithelial renewal to maintain barrier integrity. And this process is dependent on the proliferation and differentiation of the intestinal stem cell. Um, rapid turnover of the GI epithelium depends on the active proliferation and differentiation of the intestinal stem cells. And uh, the base of the crypt, at the base of the crypt resides the intestinal stem cell, which also is referred to as the crypt base columnar cell or the CBC. And you can only identify these stem cells based on the presence of the Wnt target gene LGR5. Um, so LGR5 uh, columnar base cells uh, can give rise to all the differ different epithelial cells and are considered self-renewing, long-lived, and multipotent uh, 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 stem cell. Uh, between the intestinal stem cell and the panna cells are the position four cells, which are considered the so-called reserve stem cells. And these are high, uh, been found to be highly resistant to radiation and are believed to be important for recovery from severe gut injury. Here we see a schemata of the GI epithelium. At the base, uh, we have the LGR columnar uh, stem cells, um, and uh, we have uh, the panna cells, and between the panna cells, again, are those reserve in uh, intestinal stem cells, and the intestinal stem cells differentiate into all the uh, subsequent uh, uh, epithelial cells, and so they migrate up the, the, the uh, crypt, uh, where they are ultimately sloughed, and, um, and go undergo self-renewal. Importantly, it's been very well established that the intestinal stem cell and their niche, including their niche, including the panna cells, et cetera, is a target of acute GVHD. This is shown by uh, researchers in Japan, Dr. Takashima and Fu in China. Um, and, um, and this uh, uh, helps to uh, consider future considerations in the treatment of GVHD. So immune responses are critical for maintaining homeostasis of the intestinal environment and protecting against infection, toxins during host microorganism interactions. And cytokines primarily control the immune-related events and exert a wide range of immune regulatory effects through binding uh, to cytokine receptors on the GI epithelial cells. Uh, the intestinal stem cells express multiple cytokine receptors, which determine their fate. Uh, so under the exposure of interferon gamma, interleukin-13, interleukin-17, and 22 and 10, um, the intestinal stem cells are driven towards differentiation and, um, and, uh, and uh, recovery of uh, the uh, epithelium. Um, and the interactions between the intestinal stem cells and immune cells in respect to cytokines are very complex and, and dependent on dose, both the number of Im present immune cells and the cytokine concentrations, as well as the duration of exposure, which I'll show in the next schemata. So importantly, we see here the intestinal stem cell, the columnar base cell. Um, 
fascinatingly, uh, this stem cell can uh, serve as an antigen presenting cell through MHC2, uh, MCH2 uh, pathways, it can engage T cells. And then uh, uh, under uh, exposure to Th1, Th17, and Th2 T cells, and their uh, 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 their um, cytokines, interferon gamma, IL-17A, and IL-13. Uh, this uh, 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 promotes the, uh, differentiation of the stem cells and recovery from injury. Whereas uh, when uh, regulatory T cells engage uh, the intestinal stem cell and the appropriate cytokine IL-10, this under, uh, promotes uh, renewal of the intestinal stem cell and, and, um, as opposed to differentiation. Um, so CD4 and CD8 T cells are found in the lamina propria and are thought to be derived from T cells that have been educated in secondary lymphoid organs. And short-term exposure of T cells and their and the their cytokines interferon gamma and TNF alpha lead to early and sustained activation of AKT mediated B captain uh, which promotes uh, intestinal stem cell differentiation into proliferative transitional cells and subsequent CRIP cells. But um, under prolonged exposure to these T cells and their respective cytokines, um, actually, um, um, after prolonged exposure, uh, the opposite occurs where the intestinal stem cell undergoes, uh, um, doesn't undergo um, uh, differentiation, but in fact undergoes uh, uh, um, apoptosis. And so um, here we see a schemata of the acute GVHD where uh, infusion of uh, um, T cells undergo uh, 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 in the graft undergo um, uh, proliferation of, uh, of, of uh, cytotoxic T cells who, where they then migrate to the gut through the MedCam access pathway. Um, and uh, the target of GAN as shown in the previous slides of the intestinal stem cell. So uh, quickly, um, uh, uh, future directions and treatment of gut GVHD for for the dawn of time has been immune suppression with corticosteroids, calcineurin inhibitors, methotrexate, serolimus, et cetera. Um, recently, JAK inhibitors uh, um, are believed to be an important immune suppressive agents, but importantly, um, uh, there is evidence that uh, ruxolitinib actually affects, impacts the intestinal stem cell compartment. Um, it reduces response to those inflammatory cytokines that I mentioned. It inhibits in, interferon gamma signaling, and it protects against interferon gamma-induced apoptosis of the intestinal stem cell. It reduces loss of these intestinal stem cells and panis cells via increased regulatory T cells, at least in preclinical models. Um, you mentioned that you use vetaluzumab uh, and vetaluzumab and, and inhibition of the um, alpha-4, beta-7 MedCam access and uh, decreasing uh, migration of uh, uh, these T cells to the gut is one strategy for treatment uh, of acute GVHD as well as prevention. Um, I'll share with you uh, results of uh, our work with vetaluzumab and steroid refractory acute GVHD. And there's an important um, recent study that will be coming out in Nature Medicine where uh, Eben Chen and colleagues at Mass General did a multi-center trial of vetaluzumab for prevention of gut GVHD and showed very encouraging results in this randomized trial. In terms of tissue regeneration, this is an area of active research. Uh, today, we don't have time to dive too deep into it, but there's uh, we completed trials with uh, uh, an important cytokine, IL-22, uh, uh, which is important uh, for uh, regeneration, we believe, of the intestinal stem cell. Um, and uh, there, I can uh, share with you reference for that very important study. Uh, there's work uh, being looked at and uh, with glucagon-like peptide 2 or GLP agonists uh, as a, a way to uh, promote um, uh, protection and uh, recovery of the intestinal stem cells. Uh, RIP kinase inhibitors is an area of active research. Um, as I mentioned, this was our uh, multi-center trial of uh, the important cytokine AL-22 uh, uh, treatment of patients with acute GVHD. Again, I don't have time to dive into this trial today because I want to get to your questions. Um, as I mentioned, glucagon-like peptide 2 is being studied, and uh, here's the important reference uh, uh, for that.
Um, what about uh, treatment of dysbiosis? Um, here at MD Anderson, we just completed a very important multi-center trial where we're giving uh, prophylaxis with a um, tolerizing um, 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 uh, bacteria called B. infantis that's contained in infant guts, which uh, has uh, tolerogenic uh, properties. And we give this along with its food source, uh, blood, uh, human breast milk oligosaccharide for the prevention of uh, GI, GVHD, as well as other outcomes. And of course, fecal transplants is an area of, tr uh, of study for the treatment of steroid refractory acute GVHD. Uh, the largest work uh, in this comes from the pharmaceutical company, the French pharmaceutical company, Matt Pharma, where they have a pooled FMT product, which they've done uh, phase two trials with in the setting of steroid refractory acute GVHD. And they've recently embarked upon a pivotal trial for ruxolit of refractory patients getting their pooled FMT and have preliminary, very encouraging results with uh, response rates approaching 50% in this high risk population. Um, importantly, again, um, it's artificial to think about each of these different approaches as being separate from one another because the uh, 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 immune system and uh, immune uh, cells uh, play an important role in tissue repair and regeneration and are under influence of the GI biome, um, the, and uh, all these processes are interrelated. So in the last few moments, I want to uh, review the questions that were provided to me in advance of today's talk. Uh, again, um, I will give a very cursory response, and then I can take, if the time allows, uh, a deeper look at these. And I will share with you um, a more detailed response and the important papers uh, offering um, why I support the response that I give um, to you guys. And uh, I'll send it to Dr. Nikhil for you to forward along um, to the rest of your group. Um, so one of the questions was, when do you label a patient uh, ruxolitinib refractory? Well, there is not good data uh, for how to define this population. There is consensus opinion. There's a publication in 2020 by uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Moti in France, uh, where uh, they established a definition for rux refractory as patients who progress, have progression of GVHD after five to 10 days, as defined as increased grade or stage or new organ involvement, uh, lack of response after on or after 14 days of ruxolitinib, or a loss of response defined as prog progression or, or of stage or grade or new organ involvement after initially having a response. Additionally, uh, one can consider non-reversible toxicity or failure to achieve a, a complete response or very good partial response by day 28 as being um, considerations when to uh, consider your patient's steroid uh, ruxolid and refractory. It sounds like you guys are a little bit more aggressive um, and, um, and start next line therapies early. Um, the median time to response on the REACH 1 and 2 trials were between 7 and 10 days uh, with 60 uh, a little better than 60% of the patients responding by day 14, um, but about a third of the patients uh, took longer than 14 days to respond, um, as, and as long as two and a half months to respond to ruxolitinib. So I tend to give ruxolitinib a little bit longer. Uh, it's not to say I won't start next line therapy earlier than 14 days, but I often continue the ruxolitinib uh, with the understanding that some as, as as much as maybe a third of the patients may take uh, upwards of a month or, or longer to get a response uh, based on our uh, phase two and three data. Uh, any baseline factors which uh, predict uh, for a patient being refractory to steroids or, um, or high-risk patients? Well, of course, there's the revised Minnesota criteria where patients present uh, with high risk acute GVHD. This population represents about 15% of patients with newly diagnosed acute GVHD. And uh, this is a validated uh, clinical um, uh, grading system that identifies this high risk population as being those who present with stage four skin, stage three to four lower GI GVHD, or any isolated liver GVHD. If you have more than one organ involvement of acute GVHD, you're high risk. 
Um, and uh, of course, if you have three organs involved, you're very high risk. Um, the problem with the revised Minnesota criteria is that uh, while it's very uh, sensitive, these patients indeed uh, are high risk, um, many patients in the, in the standard risk population are also high risk. And so it's not, it's not very specific. I'm sorry, it's specific, but not very sensitive. Um, at MD Anderson, we've looked to try to improve that, what additional factors uh, um, uh, may predict for higher risk populations. Well, uh, in uh, multivariate analysis, uh, we found uh, the biggest predictors of high risk are any lower GI involvement, um, patients over the age of 50, and those with high comorbidity index um, um, have uh, worse response rates as well as much higher non-relapse mortality and the presence of multiple of these factors further increases that risk. Um, back when I was a fellow, I was trained by one of the, the greats uh, by the name of Vorovit Radhanatha Therathorn, who is a, uh, did some of the pioneer work in GVHC prophylaxis. And he taught me at that time that um, you can identify a patient who's high risk when they present with severe abdominal pain that's not associated with bowel movement. So patients who have uh, GI, GVHC often have cramping bowel movements, but these are patients who have pain in between bowel movements. Uh, and we now know that uh, these patients are extremely high risk. In fact, um, that's one of the criteria for stage four lower GI in the MAGIC uh, consensus criteria. Uh, patients who have severe abdominal pain requiring IV narcotics, uh, those patients independent of diarrhea have stage four disease. GI bleeding, he taught me, anybody who presents with bloody stools, of course, are high risk. And again, this has now become part of the stage four uh, uh, lower GI criteria per MAGIC. Uh, mucus in the stool or those who present with luminal casts where you actually see sloughing of the mucosa, of course, those patients are very high risk. Um, any role of ethnicity, uh, none that I'm aware of, but if you have data, it's worth looking at and it'd be important to understand if those are psychosocial or bi um, biologic and what would be the genetics behind the difference uh, in, uh, in terms of GBHD in response to therapies. What about role of biomarkers in early prediction of severe GVHD? Well, there's a wealth of data about upfront biomarkers, serum biomarkers, which have been validated to predict day, eight, 20, day 28 response, as well as non-relapsed mortality. The best data comes from the uh, initially Ann Arbor group and later the MAGIC consortium. Uh, uh, work done in Minnesota has looked at amphiregulin, and these have been validated predictors at the time of diagnosis. But in clinical practice, how do we interpret this and what do we do with information? Yes, the biomarkers can tell us for who will do bad, but there's no data that anything beyond steroids in the upfront setting improves outcomes. And so what do you do with that data remains the area of question. Um, how do you sequence therapy in patients with refractory to steroids and ruxolitinib? Well, sequencing therapy is an area of active research in steroid refractory chronic GVHD. Do you give steroids, then ruxo, and then belumosidol or axiltilumab, or which sequence should you go in terms of treatment of those populations? But in acute GVHD, sequencing of therapy is not really an area of research because A, we don't have much beyond uh, ruxolitinib. We don't have a wealth of additional therapies which have been proven beneficial. And on top of that, the median survival after ruxolitinib failure is just 28 days. So there really is not time to really consider how to sequence therapy. Uh, what is your preferred third line agent? Well, no one can cite a preferred third line approach. Clinical trial, if you have one, is the way to go. Uh, but it really, uh, when we're considering what to give beyond ruxolinib, it depends on baseline toxicities. How does the patient's counts look? Do they have abnormal liver function tests? Are their kidneys working? Uh, what's their performance status? And so all, uh, you know, that oftentimes comes into the fold for which uh, agents we choose. Increasingly, we're getting away from uh, traditional immune suppressants uh, and instead are looking at ways to not add additional immune suppression, but hopefully promote uh, recovery of a severely injured gut. This would include drugs like alpha-1 antitrypsin, um, 
mesenchymal stem cells, betaluzumab or alpha-4 beta-7 integrins, as, as you mentioned in, in your introduction, FMT. Um, these are increasingly our, our, our therapies of choice. Occasionally, patients do respond to pentastatin in select patients, and I have a reference uh, which I can review with you. And uh, ECP, is uh, we use this mainly in patients with a refractory skin and liver, and the data for uh, ECP in patients with lower GI GVHD, at least in adults, have been very, very poor. And, and uh, at least at our center, we do not use ECP for patients with lower GI GVHD. Uh, what are the expected, uh, I'm sorry, here's some data about uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, in the interest of time, I may uh, not cover this, but again, I'll send uh, these slides over and you guys can look a little bit deeper into it. We do have a multi-center trial, which uh, I'm privileged to lead, along with my colleague, uh, John Maginot at University of Michigan, uh, looking at AAT for high-risk uh, uh, acute GVHD. Um, this is a randomized trial versus placebo. Um, there is data for pentastatin, as I mentioned. In fact, uh, in a very, very refractory population of patients who had, uh, half of them had stage four lower GI involvement. We looked at 60 patients treated with pentastatin. We saw a very promising response rate of uh, 50% in this population, um, but responses were best in patients under the age of 60. And uh, pentastatin, you have to be careful with counts. You have to be careful if their kidneys are not working. Um, and um, I encourage you to read through this paper because we share some uh, insightful information and in who may benefit from pentastatin. Um, what are expected response rates once you get beyond ruxolitinib? Well, the data would suggest that beyond ruxolitinib, expected response rate is in the order of 30 to 40 percent, with just 10 percent of those patients achieving a complete response. But even in those who respond, non-relapse mortality is very high, as I shown previously, median survival of just 28 days. Uh, Organ-specific treatment for GVHD, do some agents work better? In general, some agents appear to work better for certain organs versus others, but apart from what I mentioned below, not really. We, we don't really think about it in that way. But uh, of course, ECP, as I mentioned, uh, we mainly at our center limit it to those with skin and liver GVHD, mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, the previous phase three trial would suggest is most beneficial in patients with lower GI and maybe liver, but not skin. Uh, alpha-4, beta-7 integrins uh, is GI-specific, of course. FMT is considered GI-specific therapy. Uh, ECP role and median number of sessions to expect a response, how long to continue it. Well, our approach is to consider it for patients with steroid refractory acute GVHD, the skin and liver. Uh, we typically give eight to nine sessions through day 14, six sessions between days 15 to 28, and eight sessions between 29 to 56. And this comes from the uh, randomized uh, phase two trial that I conducted in acute GVHD using ECP and has previously been published upon. Um, and we typically give ECP for a month before stopping it for lack of response. There's that paper that I mentioned. And again, I'll send these slides along. Um, role of F FMT, how often, how long to continue it? Well, we typically give one FMT, typically via enema. In a patient who responds but receives broad-spectrum antibiotics, it, I guess it's rational to give uh, another treatment. But at our center, uh, we typically just, if we're going to give FMT, we give it just once. Um, in the MAT trial that I shared a little bit of data with, uh, they give up to three FMTs. Um, um, we don't know more is better. Uh, I would offer caution that you have to be careful when doing FMT. There has been uh, case reports of fatal bacteremia, bloodstream infections with patients who receive products that contain multi-drug resistant organisms. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Philippe uh, at Mass General, along with Eben Chen, published in New England Journal New England Journal of Medicine, an important paper where they had fatal bacteremia and, and traced it back to the product received. And so screening your stool is very important. And there is uh, best practices and published best practices for that, that screening. Um, again, the largest data for uh, making the case for FMT come from the Matt Pharma Group out of France. 
and there's an ongoing uh, prospective trial in ruxolitinib failure patients, uh, primarily being done in France, and they've seen very encouraging results, maybe responses as high as 50% in this very high-risk population. Role for vetaluzumab? Um, well, uh, the largest trial that I'm aware of for vetaluzumab for steroid refractory QGVHD was a retrospective analysis that we published on here at MD Anderson. Um, you can see the reference there. Uh, 21 patients with a refractory lower GI GVHD were given vetaluzumab. Um, these patients uh, had failed uh, uh, multiple lines of therapy uh, with the median three prior lines of therapy. Um, and we saw a response rate of about a third um, and um, in patients who are refractory to ruxolitinib, the response rate surprisingly was a little bit better. It's hard to know what to do with that data, but in the patients who had previously re received and maybe were continuing to receive ruxolitinib, uh, the response rate to vetaluzumab approached 50% at day 28. Um, the drug was very well uh, tolerated, but we don't give it to patients with abnormal, uh, significantly abnormal LFTs based on package insert. Mosaicomal stem cells, um, well, uh, um, we have a, uh, I'm sorry, is that the next topic? Uh, as far as mesenchymal stem cells, we are conducting a trial here at MD Anderson um, with mesenchymal stem cells for patients uh, who are steroid refractory. Um, um, we give um, uh, uh, mesenchymal stem cells derived from umbilical cords. Uh, this is a randomized trial of giving this in combination to Ruxo at two different dose levels versus uh, Ruxo alone. Uh, and this is mainly given for patients with refractory lower GI GVHD. And so far, the results have been very encouraging. Response rates uh, higher than 50% have been seen. Uh, and of course, this is very well tolerated. So yes, we do give mesenchymal stem cells primarily within the context of a clinical trial. Um, what about lithium? Um, uh, lithium, the data for lithium comes from um, publications out of the Fred Hutch, uh, primarily by Paul Martin. Um, the rationale for giving lithium is that it does, uh, in preclinical models, appear to promote uh, recovery of the intestinal stem cell via the Wnt signaling pathway. And so they did a small pilot study in patients who had advanced histologic uh, GVHD of the lower gut. So these are patients with histologic grade three or four, you know, denuded bowel. And uh, these patients historically do very poorly. Um, patients with histologic grade four may have uh, 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 non relapse mortality that approaches 80% and very poor response to steroids. In this small pilot trial done uh, out of Fred Hutch, and when they gave lithium, the response rate in combination lithium with steroids and other agents uh, in this very high risk population approached 67%. Um, the drug is not without uh, toxicity. It does cause somnolence, it can affect counts, it can affect LFTs. We have some limited experience at MD Anderson. Um, I haven't found it uh, overwhelmingly successful. Um, uh, occasionally, we will give it a try. What about progenol? Um, so this is urinary-derived uh, HCG coming from work done by Shernan Holton at University of Minnesota. Uh, she's published on uh, uh, given this agent for steroid refractory GVHD, and, and her results um, in her publication would suggest that this uh, therapy offers uh, some benefit. Um, I would caution that um, she didn't use traditional definitions for a response, and many of these patients received this therapy in combination with other therapies, including ruxolitinib. Um, and so I've been cautious in the interpretation of that data. Um, I provide some slides in the in the in the uh, in the slides that I will forward along. I provide some data regarding those studies. Let's see what else do we have here. Um, how uh, long do you continue treatment and how do you taper? Uh, typically, I give high dose steroids, two milligrams per kilogram for 10 to 14 days in, in non responding patients before I taper. Why do I wait that long? Well, as I shared with you earlier, um, better than 50% of the patients may be slow responder to steroids, and, and I want to afford them the opportunity to respond. So, unless I have to, for clinical reasons, I continue um, 
high dose steroids for at least 10 to 14 days before I begin to taper. Um, but we do taper steroids when starting second line therapy, and this is very important. Uh, we have institutional pathway for tapering steroids when we begin second line therapy, which generally calls for tapering the steroids rapidly by 25% every four to five days in the absence of GVHD progression. And we taper it down until a minimum dose of about 15 to 25 milligrams of prednisone are, is achieved. And uh, beyond steroid refractory, we have an institutional approach for tapering steroids in all patients. And this is somewhat based on organ manifestation and, and risk categories. Infection prophylaxis, of course, is important in steroid refractory acute GVHD. We give mold active azoles, we give Valtrex to prevent HSV, we give latirmavir in CMV seropositive patients, and we give some form of PG, PJP prophylaxis, uh, uh, be it mepron, pentamidine, or Bactrim in those with uh, good uh, platelets and kidney function. Um, what about antibacterial prophylaxis, um, especially in patients who have lower GI uh, GVHD, patients who have acute GVHD, again, especially those with lower GI GVHD, are at much higher rates for bloodstream infection, but there is no data to suggest that given prophylactic antibacterials uh, prevents these infections and may be detrimental uh, with regard to the GI biome. So in general, we avoid uh, giving um, routine prophylaxis against bloodstream infections unless the patient is neutropenic, in which case we use quinolones. We do aggressive screening for viral infections, including CMV, adenovirus, and EBV. We do weekly screening blood cultures, and uh, we have a low fresh threshold for getting uh, baseline CT of the chest uh, for screening for fungal infections. Uh, cytokine assays to determine refractoriness, I previously touched upon a little bit. Um, what about um, when patients are steroid and ruxolid and refractory? Should you taper them off of therapy. My practice is generally to give ruxolitinib for at least one month, but we'll all often start uh, next line therapy concurrently. Why do I give the ruxolitinib for at least one month? Well, as I mentioned in the previous REACH one and two trials, while most patients did achieve a response by 14 days, um, uh, about a third uh, took much longer to respond. And if they're tolerating the ruxo, I, I do continue it. Um, any infections uh, that are higher with certain approaches than others, such as CMV, well, it's impossible to compare uh, across prospective and retrospective reports, the risk for infections and compare therapies in that regard. But there are therapies that have been reported to result in high viral reactivation, including CMV. These therapies include, of course, ATG, pentastatin, but importantly, um, anti-TNF agents have also been implicated to result in high rates of viral reactivation, including CMV. Uh, in, in the REACH2 trial, uh, comparing against best available therapy, CM rates, CMV rates did not appear to differ between the arms. Um, I believe those were all your questions, and I really appreciate uh, your attention, and I'll gladly take uh, any additional questions if time al uh, allows. And again, I'll forward uh, more detailed responses to those questions you provided to me, to Nikhil, who can forward on to uh, all you guys for your review. And those would include references and a more deep dive into re the responses of your very thoughtful questions. If you have any additional questions, here's my email address. Feel free to, to email me any questions you may have. And uh, I look forward to future collaboration and hopefully meeting up in person with your team. Um, and again, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Alausi. That was an excellent talk, considering we asked you to give this talk at the last minute at such short notice. You have prepared extensively. The way you explain the pathophysiology of gut GVHD and your approach, as well as the way you patiently answered all our questions, really wonderful. Enjoyed your talk. We have a couple of questions which have come in from the audience. Uh, shall I start with them? Sure. Sure. So in patients who are on azole antifungal prophylaxis, do you reduce the dose of ruxolitinib? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, um, there may be a drug interaction with uh, azoles, including um, Oza and Vori. No, in general, we don't. We let uh, toxicities dictate when to tape, when to reduce the dose. 
Dr. Roy has a question. A 41-year-old male case of relapsed refractory angiomonoblastic T-cell lymphoma underwent a mud transplant. On day plus 22 of transplant, patient developed fever, rash, and loose stools. Lower GI scopy as well as upper GI endoscopy. Diagnosis was grade 2 gut GVHD. However, the CMV immunostain also came out to be positive after 48 hours. Mm -hmm. So his question is, in the scenario where there is strong evidence of GVHD involving multiple organs, but the gut biopsy also shows a CMV IHC coming out to be positive, how do you treat these patients with concurrent CMV infection and acute GVHD? So I love this question. Thank you so much. It's a great question and one that uh, does require um, uh, some nuance. So um, uh, weekly, uh, for the past 20 years, uh, uh, I meet every week and review slides uh, for acute GVHD and with all my pathology colleagues. And, and um, it's not, uh, when you do IHC, it, it's not uncommon in high-risk populations uh, to see IHC come back positive. If you open textbooks of pathology, they will tell you uh, you cannot read GVHD in the presence of CMV infection on, on biopsies. In fact, that is not the case. So uh, how do we interpret when we see CMV IHC? Well, number one, if it's just one positive cell or here or there, and majority of what you're seeing is the changes of GVHD, your patient has GVHD. Of course, CMV uh, is and, and GVHD are not exclusive to each other. In fact, um, very well and commonly, uh, CMV likes to um, colonize uh, injured organs, including the gut. And so concurrent GVHD uh, is, is not uncommonly present. Um, when we look at the slides, we look away from where we're seeing the CMV and we look for the changes of GVHD, whether it be in a different uh, fragment from a different part of the gut or even on the same fragment away from the area where we're seeing the CMV, we can certainly look for the changes of GVHD. Um, how do we treat? Well, we treat both entities. Um, I can tell you just countless cases I, I receive uh, uh, emails um, weekly from colleagues across the, the country and the world about, uh, you know, how will you treat such and such patient who has steroid refractory GVHD. One of the most common pitfalls is when um, I see these patients, you know, we patient came in with two, three liters of diarrhea. Um, we thought it was C. diff. We thought it's CMV. We thought it was the magnesium. We waited. It didn't get better. We thought it was the mycophenolate. We stopped the mycophenolate. Um, patients require treatment for GVHD, and more than likely, the patient has infection plus GVHD rather than infection alone as the driver of the diarrhea. You treat with high-dose steroids. Uh, of course, we would use phoscarinet or or um, gancyclovir if the counts uh, allow. Um, I would offer caution of using ruxolitinib concurrently with gancyclovir because of count suppression. And if the kidneys allow, we would give phoscarnet. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, definitely. So you would go ahead with the high-dose steroids and treat the CMV concurrently. Absolutely. Uh, importantly, another thing that I meant to touch upon is um, I uh, we commonly get repeat biopsies of the gut uh, in patients who are refractory or haven't responded to steroids. And we learn a lot of important information. Uh, data would suggest about 10 to 15% of the times you will find concurrent infection, mainly CMV uh, in those populations, uh, even in the absence of viremia. And so you, uh, that's one of the reasons we get repeat endoscopy in these populations. Additionally, um, Sometimes we see, uh, you know, the immune response. We see uh, that the apoptosis and the injury has stopped, but we just have ineffective regeneration of the mucosa. And our approach, whether right or wrong, in those patients tend to be to give therapies directed at um, recovery uh, and healing of the gut rather than further immune suppression. Whereas in a patient who had uh, regeneration, regenerative uh, mucosa. Um, but ongoing severe aptosis, we may lean a little bit more toward uh, giving therapies like pentastatin or other immune suppressives. Additional questions? Uh, 
a practical question from uh, our end. One, when a patient comes in with profuse diarrhea, do you, how long would you wait before starting steroids? Because very often it's very hard in clinical practice to differentiate between infective diarrhea versus gut GVHD. So would you do an infective workup first? And what is the latest that we can really wait to start on steroids? We never, never, uh, never uh, delay steroids in a patient who presents with diarrhea. As soon as GVHD starts steroids, you could always stop them if it's 100% certain that the GVHD is caused by infections. I realize that maybe the infectious infection profile in India may be different than it is in the United States. Um, um, I still see no downside to starting the steroids. Again, majority of the times, even when infection is present, it's infection plus GVHD rather than infection alone. It's obviously from an immune biology perspective, uh, hard, not hard to rationalize that um, infection of the gut would lead to further recruitment of uh, T cells and an injury of the gut and promote a GVHD. And so we don't wait. Uh, somebody uh, presents with diarrhea, we admit them, start steroids, and we scope them. There's uh, sometimes I get the question: Does uh, steroids change uh, the way the histology looks under the microscope? Well, the GI mucosa tends to uh, regenerate itself over three to seven days, and and I have seldom, if ever, seen a case where I thought steroids uh, have. Um, changed uh, or inhibited my ability to establish the diagnosis of GI, GVHD when we review those slides. So we wouldn't wait, we would start it. Um, never delay steroids in patients with diarrhea. This is a high risk manifestation of GVHD. I think that's a very strong message that should go out to all our audience that we should start steroid at the earliest in patient presenting with post-transplant diarrhea. Uh, many of the patients with acute gut GVHD, at least a third of them tend to go into chronicity, especially with severe grade 3, grade 4. So are there any strategies that can prevent chronicity in these patients? Do you advise any particular agents? Yeah. So chronic, uh, your um, question is uh, patients with high risk acute GVHD, that's a risk factor for development of progressive chronic GVHD. And can we do anything to prevent the development of chronic manifestations in somebody who uh, responds from their acute GVHD but uh, is now at risk for chronic. Um, well, there have been prophylactic strategies to prevent chronic GVHD. Of course, publications have given bertuximab late to prevent chronic GVHD, given uh, the BTK inhibitors to prevent uh, uh, chronic GVHD. Uh, in those uh, prospective trials, one of the interesting exclusion criteria were those with prior grade three to four acute GVHD, which uh, limits the interpretation of those trials. But in general, uh, I would say, um, you know, making the case for ruxolitinib and continuation of ruxolitinib uh, um, um, certainly would be there. Uh, rux there is evidence that ruxolitinib as a prophylactic agent can prevent chronic GVHD uh, when used uh, um, uh, in combination with other prophylactic agents. And so uh, one rationale for continuing ruxolitinib as you taper steroids and other therapy uh, would be that it may mitigate against development of chronic GVHD. But at this time, there is no um, uh, evidence that I can offer for that other than trials where ruxolitinib was incorporated into a GVHD uh, prophylaxis backbone, and those trials showed low rates of chronic GVHD. One last question from our end before we wind up. It's very common to have a GVHD flare, especially when we steroid taper steroids and ruxolitinib. So how do you prevent GVHD flares? And on tapering immunosuppression, if patient has a flare, how do you treat that? So um, a flare as you're coming off of steroids or ruxolitinib can be seen. Um, typically, if, it's, if they've gotten successfully to a low dose of steroids or maybe stop their steroids and the flare occurs, I will transiently for a few days, go up to one milligram per kilogram, uh, followed by a rapid taper to um, a dose level just uh, slightly higher than uh, where the flare was achieved uh, or seen. Um, let's say a patient uh, um, 
flared at five milligrams of prednisone, I'll give, uh, and they weigh 60 kilograms, I would give two or three days of 60, 40, 20, uh, 10, and then hold them at 10 for, you know, a few weeks if if they can tolerate it and, and then try again at a slower, slower pace. Uh, unless they are flaring at very high doses of steroids, I wouldn't consider next line therapy in those patients. But if somebody is flaring at, you know, a half milligram or one milligram per kilogram of steroids, you know, they're not likely to, they're likely to be steroid resistant. And I would start whatever next line therapy is appropriate in those patients. And that's similar to what I would do in chronic GVHD as well. Can GVHD have fever as a manifestation? And does the presence of fever make GVHD a less likely diagnosis? Uh, absolutely. So uh, uh, GVHD, uh, especially in the early, you know, traditional post-engraftment period can present as fever. Uh, um, skin commonly will present with low-grade fevers. Um, and uh, and um, I have seen in my clinical practice, even if patients present with high-grade fevers and, you know, two or three days later develop a uh, frank rash in the absence of any additional findings for uh, infection. So absolutely fevers can. Um, of course, you have to, you would never just attribute it to GVHD. Of course, you're going to work it up and evaluate the fevers and if appropriate, start antibiotics and what have you. But 100% um, uh, definitively uh, acute GVHD can present with fevers. I think with that, we come to the end of questions in the chat box and from our end. Once again, Dr. Alausi, it was a pleasure interacting with you. The clarity of thought and the simplicity with which you answered all our questions, it was really wonderful. And I'm sure this session would go a long way in recognizing and treating GVHD more effectively in our routine clinical practice. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Uday and Dr. Alausi for joining us and sparing your time on this busy Friday morning. Thank you, Nikhil. I am going to forward, uh, as I mentioned, I, I really provided a lot of additional slides and references to the response to those questions. I'm going to forward those slides to you, Nikhil, and I'll leave it up to you to send along to your colleagues. And then if there's further questions, my email's here. Feel free, have a low threshold. I, 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 I never mind getting an email a question um, about a patient or just a question you may have about GBHD. And I really enjoyed this session. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Uday, for inviting me to, to the session. Thank you, Amin. That was a fantastic talk. Fantastic, really. Thank you so much. That would be great. I'll definitely share it with my colleagues. And thank you, Dr. Uday and Dr. Alausi. We hope that we can have more such educational and interactive sessions in the future. Before, we wind, up, before we wind up, I would also like to thank MQ Pharmaceuticals for organizing this and providing the back-end support. It was a very smooth session and there was no hiccups in between. The session was very well organized. I also thank each and every one of you who has logged in on this Friday evening from India and all the other countries with more than 300 participants all over the world who could effectively participate in this. Thank you one and all and we'll continue with our educational webinars next month. Thank you so much.